Welcome to Meeple Mentor. I'm Jared, and we're about to play Marvel Dice Throne. Let's take a look. I'll show you how. Feel free to pause the video as needed to follow along with your copy of the game. My goal is this video can not only teach you to play, but can be shown at the game table to help set up and teach the game at your next game session. As part of that goal, I've added chapter timestamps in the description to the different sections of the tutorial to easily recap relevant rules for you. My copy of the game is the battle chest that includes the eight heroes released through the Kickstarter campaign, plus the custom card sleeve bags and promo cards. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell below the video so you don't miss any of my latest content. Marvel Dice Throne is a dice-checking, fast-playing game of skilled card play and abilities where players are each a Marvel superhero or anti-hero battling each other. Just like other Dice Throne games, the new characters can be combined with other games of Dice Throne. Out of the box, you can choose to be one of eight heroes. Black Panther, Captain Marvel, Black Widow, Scarlet Witch, Loki, Thor, Doctor Strange, or Miles Morales Spider-Man. Attack each other by rolling your character's unique dice, gain combat points to use on cards for special effects, and upgrade your abilities throughout the game. Reduce your opponent's health to zero to win. Let's look first at how to set it up. The first step in setting up Marvel Dice Throne is to have each player choose a hero to be and take their tray and all the components that go with it. Each character has many of the same components and can set up mostly the same way. However, I'll go through each of the eight characters to describe their setup in more detail later. In fact, I'll be separating each character out into their own teaching section. Unfold the character's board and lay it out in front of you. Set the hero page to the left of your board. You can read the front to get an idea for their background, specialties, and strategies. There's rules clarifications for each specific character on that side, and a description of all the components that go with them found at the bottom of the page. Players may want to choose their hero based on how complex their playstyle is. The rating is shown on their page, with a rating shown by the dice. The higher the die face, the more complex it is to play. The opposite side always shows the character's abilities and specials that may use unique tokens. It also shows the odds of each of their unique die faces and on which number they're found. The unique dice faces are named for each hero. Every character will have five unique dice. Gather all of their special status tokens and companion tokens and place them in their respective spots on their hero page. Everyone takes a health dial. Set it to 50 in a one-on-one -on -one game. Set it to 35 if a three-player game. A four-player game is done in teams, 2v2. Each team shares a health dial starting at 50. The five to six player game isn't recommended except for experienced players. In fact, if you have six people, you should pair up and play three separate one-on-one -on -one games while everyone is learning the rules. Afterwards, come back together for the large game of King of the Hill. I'll teach that variant at the end of the video. Each player takes a combat point dial and sets it to two. Shuffle your hero deck and draw the top four cards to gain your starting hand. Keep the deck at the top right next to your board. The discard pile will go below it. Everyone rolls one die. Whoever rolls the highest number becomes the start player. Before starting the game, make sure everyone has read their character sheet and board abilities and performed any start of game special setup steps. Check the passive ability area at the bottom left of the boards. You may find special setup instructions there too. The hero page describes all their status effects and companion rules. If you want to use the timestamps in my video description to jump to your selected characters, you can do that now to get their unique setup instructions, then come back to the game overview. I will go over each character's specials separately later. The objective of the game is to reduce your opponent's health to zero. The moment your health gets to zero, you're defeated and out of the game. If all remaining players are reduced to zero simultaneously, it's a draw. With healing abilities, you can gain health back, but are limited to 10 points above your starting health. On each character's hero board, 
you'll see a number of abilities laid out in the shape of the cards. There's usually four on the left and four on the right. Some of the abilities are used for offense, which can be used at the end of your offensive roll phase to deal damage to another hero. If your hero has a passive ability, it will be found in the bottom left with a kind of pink border. These are always active or just available for use as it's described. On the other side of the board in the bottom right, you'll see your defensive ability in a green border. This is what you're able to activate to reduce or react to incoming damage from an opponent. You'll get to roll a number of dice to defend, shown by how many dice outlines are shown below the title of the ability. Black Panther would roll three dice for his defensive roll, for example. The dice are only rolled a single time for defense. Sometimes you are given multiple defensive abilities, but you would have to choose which one to use before rolling. There are different types of damage, not all of which can be defended against in this way. One such attack is the ultimate ability of a hero. Each character's ultimate ability is found in the center of the board under their picture. If activated, the effects are completely unstoppable. The offensive abilities and ultimate ability will display one or more ways to activate it using your rolled dice. You must have the required die faces in the number shown to trigger it. Only one offensive ability can be used on your turn. To activate some, it asks you to make a small straight or large straight. A small straight consists of four dice in sequential order. Remember, each die is also numbered 1 to 6, in addition to having unique icons. The large straight requires any five consecutive numbers to activate. The effect of any ability activated is written below the dice requirements. When you see roll number dice icon, it means to roll that number of dice one time and resolve the effects that follow. Previously rolled dice can't be used for this effect. When you see on symbol in the text, it means you get the benefit shown if your roll contains the symbol shown. The benefits are gained once, regardless of how many times your roll had that result. If you see a number with the multiplication times a dice icon, you multiply the number by the quantity of dice displaying that symbol to determine the total. Statements separated by an or mean you can only resolve one of them. The then effect means to do this part only after completing the effects before it. And if you see steal on an effect, you take that resource from your opponent and give it to yourself. So if it's health, they reduce theirs and you increase yours. If they don't have as much as what you should steal, take only as much as they have. Some heroes have companions that have custom rules found on their hero page. Thor comes with his Mjolnir hammer, which is considered a companion. A companion could be tokens, dials, or other custom components. They are immune to cards and abilities that would alter status effects, as they aren't status effects. Companions can't be removed, transferred, or destroyed unless otherwise stated. Each player starts with two combat points on their dial to start the game. More combat points can be earned by discarding cards from your hand for a point each. Additionally, you gain one point automatically at the start of your turn during the income phase. The points are mainly used to play cards from your hand to trigger their effects. You can have at most 15 combat points at a time. To spend points, roll the dial down the number being used. Heroes have their own set of hero cards, which you'll shuffle at the start of the game into a deck and draw four for your starting hand. Anytime you should draw a card from the deck but it's empty, reshuffle your discard pile to make a new deck and keep drawing. You can have any number of your cards in your hand during your turn, but at the end you are forced to discard down to six. The discards will give you a combat point each. There are different kinds of hero cards found in all the hero's decks. Each of them has a combat point cost to play found on the left of the card. CP stands for combat points. Some are free to play as they cost zero combat points. There are two types of cards, hero upgrades and action cards. Upgrade cards have the arrow icon shown next to their cost, while action cards have a star. Additionally, hero cards can only be played during the phase allowed, shown by the color and icon below the cost. The blue M icon means it can only be played during one of the two main phases on your turn. Let's look a little more closely at the hero upgrades than the action cards. The upgrade cards are named after spaces found on the hero board. 
Offensive upgrades have a white border, defensive upgrades have a green border, and passive upgrades have a purple border. They can be played on your turn by spending the combat points shown and putting them on the matching named space of your hero board. Once played, they can't be removed from your board. They can't be discarded or sold for a combat point once played. Some heroes have abilities on their board that can be upgraded more than once. You'll see in their decks Roman numeral 2 or 3 after their title, indicating their upgrade level. You could pay to place a level 3 upgrade on your board directly without having to have already placed the level 2 card. However, you would only pay the combat point difference if the level 2 card was already played. The action cards have the star icon and must be played on the phase indicated. They're played by spending the combat point shown on the left, doing the described action, and placing it in the discard pile. The blue bordered action cards with the M icon must be played during one of your two main phases of your turn. The red bordered action cards with an exclamation mark can be played anytime, including during another player's turn. These instant action cards can be used to interrupt a hero's action or ability, except other instant action cards. They resolve immediately and can't be interrupted. Whatever action or ability was interrupted completes after resolving the instant effect. Lastly, the roll phase action cards have an orange border and dice icon shown and must be played during either an offensive roll phase, defensive roll phase, or targeting roll phase. These can be played on any player's turn. If multiple players try to play instant actions at the same time, there can be confusion over whose action should resolve first. The player whose turn it is has priority, regardless of who initiated the instant action first. For instance, played by several people, priority starts with the active player, then in clockwise turn order. The current player gets priority regardless of how many instant cards a player wants to use. Spending a status effect token is not an instant action. Cards and abilities that aren't labeled as an instant action card are interruptible. Now I'll go into all the phases of a player's turn and how it works. Before I do that, I'll mention that whoever takes the first turn of the game will skip the second phase, the income phase. After that, every turn is the same, going through each of the eight steps. There's eight phases to go through on a player's turn. Upkeep, income, main phase one, offensive role phase, targeting role phase, defensive role phase, main phase two, and finally the discard phase. The upkeep phase happens at the start of your turn first. Check if you have any status effects or abilities that activate during your upkeep phase and resolve them. You can choose the order to resolve them if you have multiple effects. All damage or healing effects are accumulated and applied simultaneously at the end of this phase. Second, you'll resolve the income phase. Increase your combat point dial by one point, only up to 15. Then draw one card from the top of your deck to your hand. Next is your main phase, where you can do any of three options as many times as you like. You can sell a card from your hand to the discard pile to gain a combat point. You can also play action cards and upgrade cards from your hand by paying the combat point cost. The upgrade cards cover the correspondingly named space on your hero board. Action cards resolve their effect shown, then go to the discard pile. Now you'll be able to make up to three roll attempts with all five of your dice. Additionally, throughout this phase, any player may play roll phase action cards. You can re-roll any dice and then re-roll a second time any number of dice. Once you're done rolling or satisfied with what you have, you can either announce the offensive ability you're going to activate or announce that you aren't going to activate an offensive ability. Your final dice results must meet the activation requirements of the ability you choose. In a 1v1 game, you should ask your opponent now if they want to alter your dice or let the ability happen. In a three or more player game, you'll wait until the targeting phase to determine the opponent who will be able to respond then. If any player has altered any dice, you can announce a different offensive ability to do based on the new results. Or if you still have unused rerolls, you could reroll attempt again. If choosing an offensive ability to activate, determine its effects and resolve any that don't require a target first. Effects like gain agility, gain radiance, heal, or others will trigger first. Before resolving the damage, you'll now proceed to the targeting roll phase. In a 1v1 game, it's always the other player. In a three-player game, you can choose your opponent. 
In a 2v2 team game, you'll roll a single die to determine the target. I'll cover the three and four player games in greater detail later. The next phase is the defensive roll phase, which occurs when there's an attack to resolve. With a target opponent now, you'll first resolve any effects from the offensive ability that requires a target and isn't damage related. For example, the bag of tricks or webbed effects. Next, if it was an attack that has a defendable damage type to it, the defender gets to activate their defensive ability. The defender does only one roll attempt with a number of dice according to their board. Based on the roll result, the defender resolves first non-damage effects. Then there's one last opportunity for any player to spend status effects or play cards before calculating the result. Add up all damage, prevention, and healing effects accumulated. These apply simultaneously at the end of this roll phase. Should all players have their health reduced to zero, the game is a draw. Apply any damage by reducing the hero's health dials. After the damage and offensive ability is fully completed, you get to do one more main phase on your turn. It's identical to the first one, where you can do any of the three options any number of times. Sell a card, play a main phase action card, and play a hero upgrade. The final phase is the discard phase. You must sell cards from your hand until you have six or less cards. You can discard any you want since each one gives you a combat point. Any sold cards are placed in your discard pile. While applying damage seems pretty straightforward, there's actually five types of damage that can be done to players. The amount of damage waiting to be dealt is known as incoming damage. Normal damage is noted with just the abbreviation DMG. The other four types of damage are called undefendable, pure, collateral, and ultimate. Normal damage is the most common type, which has a black circle with a number in it, followed by DMG. It can be defended against, meaning the player can use their defensive ability. It's really the only type that is defendable this way. It can be avoided and modified as per certain effects and abilities. Another type of damage is known as undefendable damage, noted with a red circle with a number in it, followed by undefendable DMG. While it isn't defendable, it can be avoided and modified. Any avoidable damage can be reduced, prevented, interrupted, or otherwise just avoided by certain cards and status effects. Modifiable damage can be changed with attack modifiers. Attack modifier cards are called that in the center of the card and can be played before or after a defensive ability. Attack modifiers can only be played on attacks, meaning an offensive ability that targets a player to do at least one damage. Pure damage is a different kind of damage, also noted with a red circle with a number in it, followed by pure DMG. It can't be defended or modified but it could be avoided. The next type you'll find is called collateral damage. It has a red circle with a number in it followed by collateral DMG. It is not defendable or modifiable. It can be avoided. This type has special targeting rules that are always specified on the ability or card. It's unique too because it doesn't qualify as an attack since it doesn't directly target someone. The last type of damage only comes from a hero's ultimate ability known as ultimate damage. It's not defendable or avoidable. It can be modified, but only by increasing the damage dealt, not decreasing. If their ultimate ability activates, the effects are completely unstoppable. It can't be interrupted, stopped, responded to, or anything. No action of any kind from opponents are possible after it triggers until the end of the roll phase. The only way to stop an ultimate ability is to alter the die roll before its activation. If some of this gets a little confusing, you could check the table created and shown in the rulebook. The chart easily recaps each of the five types of damage and which ones are defendable, avoidable, modifiable, and have special targeting rules. Before going into detail on each hero and their abilities and status effects, I'll cover what the different kinds of effects are. Positive or negative status effects can be gained or inflicted on yourself or other players. They are usually from cards or abilities. Each hero has status effect tokens that accompany them and typically start in stacks on their hero page. If you run out of tokens, you can represent it with a substitute. When the status effect is gained or inflicted, take the token from the hero's page and put it in the middle of that hero's board. It's now considered in play. 
If a hero is defeated, status effects put on other players stay in play. When an effect is removed, return it to the spot on the hero's page it came from. Some status effects are spendable and get removed when you use them. Unless otherwise stated, these effects can be activated at any time during any player's turn. If spent, its effects cannot be interrupted. Some status effects are marked as persistent and remain in play until the end of the game or until a card or ability removes it. Many of the status tokens show a stack limit on the page. It refers to how many of these can be placed on a single hero at a time. A stack of two means a hero can hold no more than two of them at a time. Anything that causes a stack limit to increase only applies to that player and lasts the duration of the game. Some effects are unique and often have a custom shape or size to them. Read their description to see how they might break the standard rules. In this section, I'll cover how to set up each of the eight heroes that come in the battle chest and cover their special status effects and abilities. Note that unless otherwise specified, status tokens must be gained first before being able to use them. Black Panther doesn't have any special setup steps aside from placing his status effect tokens on his page. He is rated 2 of 6 for complexity. He has a positive status effect called Kinetic Energy. Several of his abilities on his board allow him to gain Kinetic Energy tokens which he would place on his board. His passive ability also gives him a Kinetic Energy token whenever he takes damage. According to the rules on them, for every 2 he has, his attack damage increases by 1. With a stack limit of 8, he could have up to 8 on him at a time. However, his special rules say to remove them all when he gets to his limit. When this happens, also gain 2 combat points, draw 2 cards, and deal 5 undefendable damage to a chosen opponent. His Vibranium Suit is a special token he can gain with some abilities like the Heart-Shaped Herb. While he has it, he can spend it to prevent 3 incoming damage. Black Widow is rated 4 out of 6 on the complexity rating. She starts with her 3 Covert Ops special tokens. It's a unique status effect that she can spend once per turn during her main phase to do one of two effects. She can put an ability upgrade from her hand into play without paying its cost, or draw and look at 3 cards from the top of her deck. From these, if none of them are ability upgrades, reveal them to search the deck for an upgrade. Show it to your opponents and add it to your hand. Otherwise, you can rearrange the three peaked cards in any order and put them back on the deck. She has the agility positive status effect, which she can gain from several of her abilities. It allows you to spend it to roll a die. If the result is a 1, 2, or 3, prevent half the incoming damage rounded up. The last special status effect she has is the time bomb. These are negative status effects that go on opponent's boards. An opponent can only have two at a time. Abilities like Infiltrate allow you to inflict a time bomb on someone. When inflicting it on someone, if Black Widow has at least six upgrade abilities in play, the time bomb comes with the one second side face up. Otherwise, it starts on the two second side. During that player's upkeep phase, they roll one die. On a one to five, flip the token over. On a 6, defuse the bomb and remove the token. When failing to roll a 6 when the 1 second side is showing, the bomb explodes, causing 4 undefendable damage. Then the token returns to Black Widow's page. Black Widow's passive ability is Red Room Training. You are allowed to play upgrade ability cards during any roll phase in addition to her main phase. When she has five or more ability upgrades in play, all her attacks deal one extra damage. Captain Marvel has a lot of strong damage abilities, but no passive ability or special setup instructions. She's rated a 2 out of 6 for complexity. Her unique status effect is the Cosmic Ray Tokens. It's an attack modifier token that can be spent once per turn, except the turn it's gained, to give a damage bonus. When using it, roll two dice and pick one of them to add its numerical value to the total damage being done on an attack. She has a Cosmic Flare positive status effect. When she or a hero has the token on their board, they perform a special upkeep step. It does one undefendable damage to all opponents, then the token is discarded. The Radiant status effect is also positive and can be spent to change a die result during a defensive roll attempt to a 6, the Hala Star. 
Her defensive ability deals one undefendable damage to the attacker and prevents one incoming damage to her for each Hala star rolled. As you might expect, Doctor Strange is a little more complex to play with than others. He's rated a 5 out of 6. At the start of the game, find his hero spell card called Flames of Faltine and place it face up on the Book of Vishanti location of his board. His ongoing passive ability is that once per turn during the main phase, you can prepare a spell from your hand. Preparing a spell means placing it on the Book of Vishanti and triggering the prepare effect of the card. Spell cards already there stay there. Whenever an ability or card effect lets you cast a spell, choose one from your Book of Vishanti cards and do the cast effect. He has the Crimson Bands negative status effect that can be inflicted on an opponent. When they have it on their board, the player cannot play cards during their next roll phase. After that roll phase, discard the token. He has two positive status effect tokens, Premonition and Deja Vu. The Premonition effect tokens can be discarded during the income phase to do one of two possible effects. Discarding one token lets you draw two cards instead of one. Discarding three tokens lets you draw three cards instead of one. Then one of the drawn cards must be placed on either top or bottom of the deck. The Deja Vu effect token can be spent during the offensive roll phase. Instead of activating an ability, discard this to end their offensive roll phase and start a new one. This effectively lets you roll three more times to get a better result. Loki is a playable hero in the game and has a complexity rating of 4 out of 6. During setup, find his three illusion cards and shuffle them. Set them aside out of his hero deck. He doesn't have a passive ability. The illusion tokens are a special status effect for Loki. When attacked, the player can spend one token to make the attacking player choose one of the three illusion cards randomly. You can even suggest which card they should pick if you want to be sneaky. They pick a card and reveal it, resolving the text. It could be a fail, preventing all incoming damage, or a success for the attacker, who gains a bag of tricks token. There's also the partial success, which prevents half the incoming damage rounded up. In the case of a success or partial success, the Loki player could spend another illusion token to do this process again. The Bag of Tricks positive special effect token can be gained by Loki or other players as I just explained. During the upkeep phase, that player removes it and rolls one die. On a one, lose one combat point. On a six, gain two combat points. On a two to five, Loki gets to choose if the player heals two health, gains one combat point, or receives two undefendable damage. The Bag of Tricks has a stack limit of two, so no player will have to resolve more than two on a turn. Loki has another unique status effect called Spellbound. When it's inflicted on an opponent, place the token so it covers the name of one of their offensive abilities. It can't cover the ultimate ability. That player cannot use that ability until it's been removed. If a player only has one uncovered offensive ability, they can't be afflicted with Spellbound. At the end of their offensive roll phase, remove the token. Miles Morales Spider-Man is a fun hero to play with and isn't too complicated. He's rated 2 out of 6 and has no special setup steps or passive abilities. Instead, he has two defensive abilities to choose from when defending incoming damage. Only choose one each time. He has three status effects with his character, each with a stack limit of one. The combo status token can be used to do another offensive roll phase. Unlike Doctor Strange, this effect lets you do another attack after resolving a successful attack with the first roll phase. So after the opponent's defensive roll phase from the first attack, you spin the combo token to start a new offensive roll phase. The webbed status effect is a negative effect inflicted on an opponent. It doesn't have an effect on the turn it's inflicted or transferred to someone. On future turns, when a webbed player is attacked with normal damage, the damage becomes undefendable instead. Then the webbed token is removed. Lastly, he has the unique status effect, Invisibility. When having the token on your board and you're attacked with undefendable damage, you can discard it to activate a defensive ability. Scarlet Witch has a lot of special status effects, as you may expect. Her complexity rating is 4 out of 6. She doesn't have a passive ability or special setup instructions past just putting her tokens on her page. The Probability Manipulation token is a positive status effect with a stack limit of 2. You can spin the token to change the value of any of your dice rolled with an even number up or down by 1. 
The Reality Warp token is a negative status effect with a stack limit of 1. A player with this token at the beginning of their offensive roll phase removes it and must use one of Scarlet Witch's dice in place of one of their own. The dice is kept throughout the offensive roll phase. Conjure is a positive status effect with stack limit 1. You can spend this token during your main phase to either gain a positive status effect token from any player's page or inflict reality warp on an opponent. If choosing to take a positive status effect from an opponent, they can respond by discarding a card from their hand to prevent this. The last special effect is Crackle, with a stack limit of 3. When a player with this token ends their offensive roll phase with an attack, they can choose to spend it to add 1 damage per status effect on their hero board. Don't count the Crackle token as it was just spent. This is limited to a maximum of 3 damage added. However, you can spend a second Crackle to add more damage. It's considered an attack modifier. Thor is the only hero in the battle chest that has a companion. He starts with Mjolnir on his hero board. He has a complexity rating of 3 out of 6 and no passive abilities. His guard break status effect is positive and has a stack limit of 2. The token can be spent after they do an attack against an opponent as part of their offensive roll phase. Spend it to roll a die, and on 1, 2, or 3, the attack damage becomes undefendable. He has Electrokinesis with a stack limit of 4. These can be used to boost the damage done on some attack abilities by just having them on your board. Alternatively, you can discard 3 any time to draw 1 card from your deck. Thor's Hammer is the real highlight, as it can be thrown or retrieved back for bonuses. To throw or retrieve it, you must discard a card, unless an ability tells you to do it. When thrown, put it on an opponent's board and deal one undefendable damage. When retrieved, put it back on your board and gain electrokinesis. You can only throw it if you have it on your board and can only retrieve it if it's not. If an opponent with Mjolnir is defeated, automatically retrieve it. Marvel Dice Throne is best played as a one-on-one -on -one game, so with other numbers of players, there are special rules to apply. These would be considered variant game modes. The four-player game is done as a 2v2 team game. Teammates sit next to each other and are encouraged to show their hands and strategize together. Roll the die to determine a start player. Turn order will alternate between teams in a zigzag fashion. Teammates share a health dial, which starts at 50. The start player of the game will again skip the income phase of their first turn. When one teammate takes damage, reduce the shared health dial, but if both take damage simultaneously, reduce the dial by the combined total. Each teammate will still have their own combat point dials separate from their teammate. The points can be spent for the other player. Players can't intervene to reduce their teammates' incoming damage unless the effect refers to a chosen player. However, players are able to alter the dice to prevent a teammate from taking damage in the first place. During the targeting roll phase, you'll roll a single die to determine the target. The roll can be manipulated by cards unless it's the ultimate ability. On a 1 or 2, target the opponent on your left. On a 3 or 4, target the opponent on your right. On a 5, the opponents choose which of them is the target. On a 6, you get to choose. A 3-player game is played as King of the Hill. Each hero starts with 35 health. Roll to determine first player and take turns in clockwise order. Whoever has the most health is considered to be the leader. When attacking and determining the target opponent, you get to choose. If you choose to attack the leader, you get to draw a card from your deck. Draw immediately after choosing your target before other effects happen. If you are tied for the leader and you attack the other tied player, you still draw the bonus card. This King of the Hill variant can also be played with 3 to 6 players. The rules are exactly the same. It's really the only way to play a 5 player game. There are two other ways to play the game if you have six players. The first is to split up into two teams of three. Sit together with your team with the opposite team across the table. Just like the 2v2 game, it's encouraged to view each other's hands and strategize together. Roll to determine the start player. Turn order goes back and forth in a zigzag pattern. Once again, teammates share one health dial starting at 50. The targeting roll phase is done the same as it was in the 2v2 game. The last option to play with six people is three teams of two. It's best to play on a round table as each team should sit a few seats away from the others. 
It plays similar to the other team games, but you'll go clockwise, letting player one from each team take a turn, then player two gets a turn on the next go around. The team shares a health dial, starting with 50 health. During the targeting roll phase, you'll determine the target opponent with a single roll. If it's a 1 to 4, count around the table moving clockwise, starting with the closest opponent on your left. On a 5 or 6, you can choose the opponent. Keep the rulebook handy and check BoardGameGeek.com for FAQs and extra content. The Meeple Mentor channel is now part of the board game community, the Gateway Network, made up of great upcoming board game content creators. The network includes Instagrammers, podcasters, YouTubers, artists, and much more. Head to thegatewaynetwork.com to support new and independent board gamers. Thank you for watching this tutorial. Like and subscribe if you found this teaching helpful. Stick around to watch another Learn to Play video. And remember, teach when you can, but always be learning. See you next time.